A very good afternoon to all the PGDGM students, counselors, program in charges, regional directors. Uh, it has been a long time since we've met. We haven't met for May and June for the uh, break that we had, the vacations that we had. And uh, but we are back today again uh, for uh, the next teleconferencing. Before we start the teleconferencing, I hope that um, uh, you people have all been allotted your SDCs. You have started your SDC training. And in case there is any problem, kindly let me know. I had also requested that uh, at least uh, you know the names of the group leaders should be uh, told to me from each of the centers so that we can send all important information to the group leaders and the same can be disseminated further on to uh, the rest of the students. So kindly if possible you can let me know the group leaders today either by phone or by fax uh, and the fax numbers are already the phone numbers are already being flashed so kindly note the same. Today we will be discussing about ECG. We have uh, with us Dr. Anuradha. Hello, Dr. Anuradha. Hello, Dr. Uh, Dr. Anuradha has been associated with this program since a very long time. She is associate professor in the Department of Medicine in Molana Azad Medical College. She is also a counselor for the program, and you may have seen her in many of the videos that have been prepared out of the teleconferencing sessions, also in many of the videos that are telecast on the DD or the Gyan Darshan channels. So we will today be discussing about ECG in the first session and the uh, CT and MRI in the second session. Uh, ECG even you know many of the leading practitioners do not find a lot of confidence in interpreting the ECGs and it always remains a grey area. Now we will be doing the basics of ECG with special reference to the elderly. So, uh, I would like Dr. Anuradha to start about how, if we have an ECG, how do we start the interpretation of an ECG, whether it is in the exam or whether it is in a patient when we are trying to diagnose something on an ECG or we are giving clearance to the patient for an operative procedure, how do we interpret an ECG which is given to us? Uh, good afternoon all of you. Uh, it, is, uh, it is very nice to meet you again after a long break. Uh, we are going to talk today about ECG interpretation. Many times and to many students, uh, interpreting or analyzing an ECG seems to be a very, very difficult task and most people are a little hesitant to look into an ECG and, give, and to analyze it on their own. Many people nowadays actually try to get it reported by somebody else so that they have a report in front of them which is much easier for them to do. But it is not such a difficult task to actually look into an ECG. There are very few things which you have to see on an ECG. There are just a few number of waves and some intervals and the entire ECG interpretation is built on the aspect of these things. So if you go stepwise in a manner that is very logical and sequential, it is not a very difficult task to do and interpretation of ECG should be very simple. What we will do in the about in the first session is that we will first talk about what are the different waveforms of an ECG, how does a normal ECG actually look like and then take up individual circumstances which we normally see in our day to day practice or in our day to day life and how these ECGs should be interpreted. Uh, since it is it's a, it's a, it's a difficult topic to cover in about 40-45 minutes but I will try to do as much as possible and also if you have any questions regarding any ECG during the entire period you can always give a call and then maybe we can take it up from there on. So I will start with the first slide which is about ECG interpretation. Can I have my slides? Yes. The first thing is how to approach a ECG. Whenever an ECG strip is given to you or whenever you come across an ECG strip, there is always a logical sequential way in which you should go about interpreting it. Never try to attempt a diagnosis at the first instant on just looking at an ECG. Always spend time in detailed evaluation of the ECG. Go step by step, you will never miss a finding on the ECG. 
read the ECG always in a methodical fashion, identify all the abnormalities that are there on an ECG, then interpret all those abnormalities together in a way that you will arrive at your possible full diagnosis. And if for example, you are in an examination and generally what is done is an ECG is kept as either a spotter or something like that, then there will always be one or two or three questions which will be asked based on that ECG and then you can answer those questions. But even if you are not in an exam, once you spend some time going methodically or through an ECG and interpreting all the abnormalities, you should be able to reach the diagnosis in almost all cases. So, how do you go about assessing or evaluating an ECG? The first thing you must do when an ECG strip is given is calculate the heart rate. The heart rate is to be calculated and you must identify whether the heart rate is normal or it is fast when it is called a tachycardia or it is slow when it is called a bradycardia. The next thing is you identify the rhythm. As we all know the heart has a rhythm. There is a P wave, there is a QRS complex, there is a T wave and this rhythm keeps repeating time after time after time. Please identify the rhythm and see whether this rhythm is normal or it is abnormal. And if it is abnormal, what kind of abnormality is there on the rhythm? The next thing we do when we evaluate an ECG is to look at an axis. It is called the QRS axis and there is a normal range during within which this axis should lie. If the axis lies beyond this normal range, it is called either a right axis deviation or it is called a left axis deviation or it could be an indeterminate axis and that has some uh, relevance and significance while we are interpreting other findings on an ECG. After you have seen the rhythm, after you have seen the rate, the rhythm and the axis, then you start looking at the waves and there are these four major waves which you should look for. The P wave, the QRS complex which actually is three waves, the QR and S waves but together it is taken as one complex called the QRS complex, the T wave and the U wave. Next after seeing the waves comes the intervals. The intervals are the gaps or the times in between these waveforms. So, something between the P and the QRS is called the PR interval, between the S and the T is called the ST interval and between the T wave and the pres, uh, pres, T wave and the next following P wave is called the TP interval and you have to identify whether these intervals are normal or they are prolonged or they are decreased. After you have done all this, you will be able to identify the abnormalities, put it together and then arrive at your diagnosis. So, let us start by looking at a normal ECG and on the left side of the screen you will see this is what a normal ECG strip looks like. This is on the x axis you have time, here on x axis you have time and on the y axis you have the voltage. So, when you look at waveforms, you look at the height of a waveform which is measured as volts or millivolts. And when you look at intervals, you talk about intervals in seconds or milliseconds which defines a duration of a time. This is one large square. One large square will have 10 small squares within it. Each small square is 0 0.04 seconds. Okay? So, one large square will actually be 0.2 seconds. Height of a square would be 1 millivolt and each one tenth of a small square would be 0.1 of a millivolt and that is how you decide on the duration and on the height. And if you see here, these are the waves and these are the intervals. So, the first positive wave on an ECG is a P wave followed by the first negative deflection is a Q wave. The first positive deflection after the Q wave is called the R wave and the negative deflection after the R wave is called the S wave. So, in its entirety, if the Q, R and S all three are present, it is called a QRS complex. 
why we talk of it as a complex is sometimes in some leads you may not see a Q wave, you may only see an R and an S wave, but still it would be the QRS complex where the Q would probably be very small or merged within the complex, but the complex still remains as a QRS complex. After the QRS complex, the next positive wave is called the T wave and after that is the U wave. So, this is entirely one unit and if you can see there is another P wave which is starting here. So, these are the positive waves which are seen. The intervals between the start of the P wave and the beginning of the QRS complex, remember it is the beginning of the QRS complex is called the PR interval. After this is the duration of the QRS complex, then you have the ST segment which is between the S wave and the beginning of the T wave and then you have the QT interval which is between the Q wave and the end of the T wave. Another very important interval which determines the heart rate is what is called the RR interval and that is how you actually determine the heart rate. So, the interval between two QRS complexes is called an RR interval. It is important to know these intervals and it, these uh, waveforms because each of them has a specific genesis and abnormality in any of these waveforms or any of these intervals is reflective of an underlying disease or a pathology in one particular site of the conduction system or the heart. For example, if you talk of the P wave, the P wave signifies the SA nodal activation. So, whenever the SA nodes gets activated, it produces a P wave and then when it the when the impulse travels across the atrium, it is called the PR interval. QRS basically deny, uh, defines the activation of the ventricles. So, the electrical activity during the ventricular contraction is what is signified by the QRS complex and repolarization is what is signified by the ST segment and the T wave. So, this is how you will interpret an ECG and this is what a normal ECG looks like. Normally, a PR interval is between 0.12 to 0.2 seconds. The QRS complex is between 0.08 to 0.12 seconds and that is how depending upon and you can also look at the height of a P wave which is important especially in atrial enlargements. Can we go further from here now? Yeah, maybe we can take some abnormalities yes. now, some abnormalities of the ECG. Okay. And to begin with, maybe you can just take even a normal or abnormal ECG yes. and calculate the heart rate. Yes, so we will start with the simplest of abnormalities first. Okay. Can I have the slide please? On this ECG strip, let us see what is happening here. Okay. We will see this. So, this is lead 1, lead 2, lead 3, AVR, AVL, AVF. These are what are called the limb leads. V1, V2, V3, V4, V5 and V6. These are what are called the chest leads. All of them have to be interpreted together. It is important to note one or two things before we start here that the P wave is best visualized in either lead 2 or lead V1. So, if you want to have a good look at a P wave, it is best to look at lead 2 or lead V1 and in lead V1, you P wave would have a significant negative component which is normal. That is because of the direction of the electrical activation. So, once you have seen the P wave in these two leads, you can go further. So, let us look at this lead. So, let us start. The first thing which we said when we talked about an ECG was to look at the rate. So, if you can see here, this is an RR interval, this is a P wave, this is another P wave. Similarly, if you can see here, these are the P waves. On a V on a, on V1, if you can see this is a P wave, this is a P wave here, okay, and this is the P wave here. Now, here again in V2, this becomes a P wave, this becomes a P wave. When the way to calculate RR uh, heart rate is by calculating the RR interval, okay. You can also calculate the PP interval which in case of a normal rhythm should be equal to the RR interval since each P wave should be followed by a QRS complex. If you see here, this is one P wave, this is the other P wave. Similarly here, this is one P wave, this is another P wave. This is an R wave, QRS complex, this is another R wave. And if you can see here, one, 
two, three, four, five. A little more than five small, five large squares is the RR interval. Okay, and since uh, so this is how you can actually identify the heart rate by calculating this. Since we know that each small square was 0 0.02 seconds, and we know that the rhythm strip of the ECG runs at 25 millimeters per second, the heart rate comes out to be 48. As a simple rule, if you calculate the RR interval and see how many large squares are there, 300 divided by that should give you an estimate of the heart rate. For example, in this situation, between the two RR intervals, there are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 5. Uh, small 5 large squares 300 divided by 5 is 60 however this is a little more than that so the heart rate is less than that so it's about 50 beats per minute so a normal heart rate is between 60 and 100 anything less than 60 is taken as a bradycardia anything more than 100 is taken as a tachycardia so where the heart rate is 48 it becomes a bradycardia which means it is a slowing of the heart rate so the heart rate in that ECG as you saw was normal, all other waves the QRS, the T wave, ST segment everything else was normal. So the interpretation of that ECG is the heart rate is 48 beats per minute, all the other waveforms, intervals and axes were within normal limits and the impression here is just sinus bradycardia. Now why do we have sinus bradycardia in elderly especially if we want to talk? Okay. Um, sinus bradycardia can occur as a physiological condition in certain conditions, especially in young athletes, uh, people who work out very much. Uh, it can also occur in obstructive jaundice in some situations. In the elderly, one of the common causes, if you have an ECG and you have no, nothing else with you, one of the common causes of having bradycardia on an ECG is some patient who is on a beta blocker. If any patient is on a beta blocker, that's prescribed say for an as an antihypertensive or it is prescribed in patients who are having CAD you will have a slowing of the heart rate so one of the commonest causes of a f uh, of slowing of the heart rate or bradycardia would be a patient who is on a beta blocker so if, if you have an ECG which has that abnormality please ask the patient whether the patient has ever been prescribed a beta blocker like atenolol or propranolol for whatever condition some heart rate reduces with age also how much does that reduce so but it should still remain within that uh, normal, normal range, range of 60 to 100 okay. so that that is taken that's why there so is the individual's heart rate drops down from what his heart rate at normal level yes. age was yes. to a little lower yes but not more not, less than not, not very significant mm -hmm. another thing is sometimes a slow heart rate can also be uh, an indirect evidence of an SA node dysfunction. Uh, sinus sinus node dysfunction is again a very common uh, problem in elderly patients, especially because of coronary artery disease. So these patients can have periods where there are very slow heart rates, where there are uh, where there are actually absences or gaps in SA node dis uh, function. So in SA node dysfunction. Bradycardia is one of the common uh, accompaniments. There can be periods of bradycardia and tachycardia, but bradycardia and uh, absence or sinus pauses, these two are very common um, conditions which actually define an SA node dysfunction. So you must always see that in addition to the bradycardia, is there is are there pauses or the are there gaps on an ECG where there are no QRS complexes or nothing else which is coming on an ECG strip which will be defined as a sinus pause meaning there is one peak QRS and then there is a long gap in which there is no waveform at all that means there is a pause in the electrical activity followed by another peak QRS complex and during this pause whether the patient is having some kind of dizziness or vertigo or uh, complaints of sinus, compla has some complaints. So, those sinus pauses and bradycardia together will define a sinus node dysfunction which is an important abnormality to consider in these patients. So, bradycardia also another cause of bradycardia is hypothyroidism. Uh, many times uh, patients who present with hypothyroidism can just present with bradycardia. So, if you have found no other cause you must evaluate for thyroid functions and look at the TSH as a screening modality for evaluating patients with um, bradycardia. So this was an decrease in heart rate. Now look at the other side. So this is an ECG strip as you can see what is happening here. There you saw that the RR interval was so wide. Here what you can see that there are basically less than three, less than two, two small, two large squares between a between the RR interval. 
So if you can see the RR intervals are so close and in fact the RR intervals are so close you can barely identify a P wave. That is because it is not that the P wave is absent, it is because the rate is so fast that you are not able to actually identify a P wave. What, all, what other things you can see in this is that there are some ST changes here. If you see the ST change, if you see the ST wave, ST segment here is normal. But on these leads if you see there is a depression in the STT change, ST segment here, here and here. So this is an evidence of an ST depression. When the heart rate becomes much faster, such ST changes may come which is part of a tachycardia. So what you can see here is the rate, the rhythm is normal. Okay? The rhythm is normal, so it means that it is, there is no dysrhythmia, there is normal rhythm. The rate is fast, so it is a tachycardia. And why is it a supraventricular tachycardia is, since ventricular activation is normal in the form of a normal QRS duration. If there was ventricular tachycardia or ventricular fibrillation, the QRS duration would have been prolonged. Since that is not happening, it is a normal QRS and all that is happening is that is an, there is a de increase in rate, it is called a supraventricular tachycardia. And like I said, all these red marks where you can see are STT changes or ST depression because of the tachycardia, that is what is happening. You mentioned that the P wave we normally see in lead 2 or V1. Yes. Now, uh, is there any specific leads in which we should see for the QRS and for the ST segments and the T waves? No. Um, the one thing is, uh, it, 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 the question that you have asked is good because the reason being that a P wave is best identified like I said in lead 2 and V1. QRS, T all should be seen in all other leads. It is, uh, it, it is normally seen in all leads. However, the morphology of the QRS complex in the chest leads varies from chest lead to chest lead. For example, if you can go back to the slide, I can show it to you, it is much easier. See, if you see in these leads, this is V1 and this we are going up to V6. In V1, the prominent lead on a QRS would be the S wave. It is very important. So, in a V1, V2, the prominent direction or the permanent deflection of the QRS complex is negative. So, you will have an RS pattern, a small r and a large s. However, as you see later on in V5 and C V6, what is happening is the prominent deflection of the QRS complex is positive. So, you will have a prominent R wave in the lateral lead. So, here you can see that in V5, V6, you will have a prominent R wave. The leads V3 and V4 are generally the leads where the transition occurs from this prominent S wave to the prominent R wave. In fact, if this R, if this deep S wave persists right up to V6, it is an abnormality. It is usually seen in smokers, patients who have obstructive airway disease. So, the morphology of the QRS varies and again in lead 2, usually the QRS has a positive deflection. So, if you are having a prominent R wave in V1, that again is abnormal. And if you have a prominent Q wave in V1, that again or V2, that again is abnormal. So, you have a prominent S wave in V1, V2 and then slowly the R wave starts appearing and then by the V6, R wave becomes the most prominent wave on an ECG. So, that is how, although you should see a QRS in all the leads, but yes, uh, it varies in morphology from V1 to V6, which should help us identify. What do you mean motors. by the negative deflection in V1? You mean that the QRS is inverted? No. No. You mean that the S is uh, uh, more prominent? See, whenever we talk of QRS um, deflection, you talk about the sum of the Q wave and the R wave and the S wave. When you talk of the sum of the Q wave and the R wave and the S wave, if you see in that BCG, it is negative hmm. Hmm. in yeah. this. It is a prominently negative, whereas in V6, if you see, it is prominently a positive wave. Okay. okay. That is what I meant. So, that is a sinus tachycardia. Uh, when um, do we have sinus tachycardia, especially in elderly? Uh, sinus tachycardia can occur in physiological conditions, like for example, anybody who has a fever, any infection, has had, does some exercise. All these are conditions where you can have a sinus tachycardia. Um, tachycardia in any infections can be a sign of congestive cardiac failure. Sometimes patient can just present with persistent tachycardia, which should be an, which can be an evidence of an impending cardiac failure. Another important cause for tachycardia is patients who are um, having thyrotoxicosis or hyperthyroidism, which should always be kept in mind. Uh, Certain drugs can also maybe lead to tachycardia? Sympathomimetic agents, if somebody is taking, it can give rise to tachycardia. Uh, but uh, otherwise, other than that, drugs generally 
patients who are maybe on certain antihypertensives like calcium channel blockers, for example, amlodipine, nifedipine, these can give rise to a tachycardia. So, you must be aware of what drugs patient is taking so that you can then, ident then uh, identify these. Any patient who is having persistent tachycardia on an ECG or even on a clinical examination, if you find a patient's pulse is definitely more than 120, always you must investigate the patient as to what the cause for tachycardia is. It cannot be left off as something which is aberrant, especially in elderly patients, there is always a cause for it and must, one must try and find out the cause for that. Okay, we have talked about the rate. Let us go down a little further. What you can see on this ECG that we in the first ECG we saw how everything was normal. So, if I go back you can see that the RR interval in these ECGs was all <coughs> equal. Both the RR interval here between this R and this R, between this R and this R, all in all the leads is equal. On this ECG what you can see is a very abnormal RR interval. See this RR interval which is so big and see the next RR interval against it which is so small. You can again see it here. This is another RR interval which is very big. This is a smaller RR interval which is small and the RR interval is very variable across all the leads. So, you have a variable RR interval. The second thing like I said, the first thing you must look for is a P wave. Look at the P wave in lead 2. You cannot identify a P wave. It should be a very well identified P wave in V2. Similarly, in V1, you cannot identify any P waves. Absence of P waves is very significant and it is generally seen in patients who are having atrial fibrillation which means that the SA node is not the one which is generating the uh, electrical activity but there is some other aberrant node from where the electrical impulse is being generated. So, absence of P waves is, an, is a very important indication for the presence of an atrial fibrillation. So, what you can see like I said in that ECG was you have an irregularly irregular heart rate where the RR duration is very variable. Okay, and then P, P, P waves are going at their own rate, ventricles are going at their own rate. Okay. What else is also happening is that we said earlier also that the most prominent deflection in a V1 should be a negative wave. In V1 here you can see these two prominent upright waves which is abnormal for V1. So, these are aberrantly conducted waves, these are not being conducted normally. Another thing which you can see is that there is STT changes and ST depression on the lateral leads which can be because of the tachycardia. So, this is an ECG where you are having atrial fibrillation with a rapid ventricular response. Now, atrial fibrillation is very commonly seen in elderly patients. Patients may present with congestive cardiac failure because of the fast ventricular rate. There can be hypotension which can develop because of the very fast ventricular rate and so isolated atrial fibrillation is a very important presentation and if you have an irregularly irregular pulse or a heart rate on clinical examination and on an ECG strip you are able to demonstrate atrial fibrillation, it must always set you to look for the cause for atrial fibrillation. It is one of the commonest abnormalities you see in elderly patients and some of the common causes of atrial fibrillation are congestive cardiac failure, hypertensive heart disease, patients who have hypertension and heart disease, patients who can have cr cr chronic obstructive airway diseases, they can have multiple atrial abnormalities, uh, supraventricular tachycardias like uh, they can have multiple atrial, uh, multifocal atrial tachycardias, they can have atrial fibrillation, thyrotoxicosis again can sometimes present just with atrial fibrillation. So, there are a huge list of causes. Remember that in younger patients, when patients develop atrial fibrillation, we generally tend to think of mitral valve disease like mitral stenosis or mitral regurgitation. In an elderly, you must think of more coronary artery disease or hypertensive heart disease or uh, dilated cardiomyopathy. These are more important causes of atrial fibrillation in elderly patients and you must always investigate these patients. You must get a rhythm strip which is a long strip of the ECG. You must get an echocardiography done in these patients to evaluate structural heart disease and to evaluate the function of the heart so that that will give you your answer in most instances. If you think patient is having CHF or is having dilated cardiomyopathy, it will be evident on an echo. Sometimes you may need to get a TSH in case you are thinking patient is actually having thyrotoxicosis. So, that is how you work up further. No AF atrial fibrillation can be taken as a, you know, aberrant 
just like that it has appeared on an ECG. There always is a reason why atrial fibrillation appears and you must always investigate and evaluate your patient. The sinus radicardia and atrial fibrillation like you are saying could be because of hyper or hyperthyroidism. Yes. Now in an elderly how common is it to just uh, find hyper or hyperthyroidism per se for the first time? See it is uh, if you if you take thyroid abnormalities hypothyroidism is much more commoner in an elderly patient than hyperthyroidism mm -hmm. and many times hypothyroidism presents so insidiously and so subtly that you may just Miss by it. the time mm -hmm. the patient develops the florid changes of you know thickened skin and thickened voice and rough skin all these changes it is much much later bradycardia is one of the earliest things which happens decreased or uh, or abnormalities in mentation, just slowing of mentation, lack of concentration, depression, just mild depression. So many times this is so subtle that it needs to be picked up early. So in a patient who is having mild abnormalities like this, uh, the relatives have noticed slight changes in behavior, patient is a little depressed. You should not always think it of as just part of you know depression in the elderly. It may be because of just an underlying thyroid disorder and if you are able to pinpoint that patient has bradycardia at this juncture, your diagnosis becomes much more easier in such situations. So one of the clinching um, diagnosis could be through an ECG. Uh, yes, it will show is, you a bradycardia. Who is on depression. Yeah. Yes. So you must always get an ECG done in such situations and if you are having significant bradycardia for which there is no other explanation, you should always investigate by getting a tyro TSH done. A plain TSH is always required for a screening. I think that's uh, really nice. We are not getting any questions. I am just uh, thinking that there may be a lot of, uh, I think everybody is busy taking notes maybe, but there may be a lot of ECGs that you may have come across, many situations in which you would like to know what would be the ECG changes. So I think we, we require some of you at least to find uh, what is behind your mind and what, what all information you were required to no, please uh, dial in. The phone numbers can be flashed, and uh, you can even send a um, uh, quick. You can write down on a paper and send a fax if you don't want to miss the session. And by dialing in, uh, okay. So we can just okay. Now on. we come to the next uh, ECG. If you can see, we were talked about. We had talked about rate there. Now we come to some of the individual um, abnormalities of the waves. So if you can have the ECG here, what we can see on this ECG is. The normal, this is lead 2 and this is lead V1. Like I said, lead 2 and V1 are the best places where you can actually visualize a P wave. So here you have a P wave and here you have a P wave which has a prominent negative deflection. That is normal. A negative deflection in V1 and the P wave is normal. But what is not normal here is the duration of this P wave. If you can see this red line, I don't know. You can see that the duration of this P wave is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 small squares. Here also if you see 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 small squares. A prolonged P wave duration is abnormal. Anything more than 0.2 seconds is taken as an evidence of an widened P wave which is what is clinically called P mitral. What P mitral actually suggests is that there is left atrial enlargement. What are the common cause of left atrial enlargement? In an elderly, dilated cardiomyopathy is one of the common causes where there is dilation and enlargement of all the chambers of the heart. So whenever the left atrium enlarges, there is widening of this P wave and it produces P mitral. In a younger patient, you would probably think of mitral valve disease as one of the common causes, either mitral stenosis or mitral regurgitation. But here in an elderly, you must always think of dilated cardiomyopathy as one of the common causes of P mitral or a widened. Or a, or, or a P wave which is widened and which signifies left atrial enlargement. Let us go down to the next ECG. Here this is another ECG where you can see that there is widening of the P wave and there is a broad prominent negative deflection which is seen here. Okay. This is some kind of an ECG which many people normally get to see in practice either a patient brings such an ECG to them or the patient has gone for say some kind of a procedure um, say maybe a cataract surgery and somebody advises a pre anesthetic ECG or the patient goes for some other surgery gallbladder surgery whatever and then as part of a routine pre anesthetic checkup an ECG is done which shows some abnormalities and then it is referred the patient is referred back to a doctor or a physician where you have to then evaluate what is the significance of this ECG. If you can have back the ECG, what we can see on the ECG is 
what is most prominent is in this ECG there are many other findings but the okay. most prominent thing which sticks out and which stands out is this STT change which is ST depression which is very prominent if you can see in lead to, in lead 1 in lead 2 3 in lead AVF V3 to V6 you have this prominent ST the ST segment is depressed very prominently ST segment depression is actually a feature of ischemia or ongoing ischemia and it is a very important indicator of an underlying coronary artery disease it is however important to remember that suppose there is STT changes in just one lead isolated lead in the entire ECG of 12 leads not much significance can be attached to it however if it is occurring in contiguous leads which are significant for example it is occurring in all the inferior leads that is occurring in 2, 3 and AVF or it is occurring in all the anterior leads say V, V4 to V6 as the lateral leads and anterior leads then it becomes very significant also it is important to remember that if the patient was symptomatic during that period for example he was having mild breathlessness or uh, chest pain which was significant to angina and at that time this ECG was done and it picked up the STT changes that ECG is extremely significant as a marker of yes, ongoing you. angina or a coronary artery disease once you have such an ECG and once there are these abnormalities or the patient is symptomatic then you should go ahead and always evaluate these patients for an underlying coronary artery disease the simplest thing you can do is a treadmill test or a TMT that is the first thing you should do unless there are any contraindications to it this will not suggest this will only suggest ischemia it will not suggest um, uh, myocardial infarction old myocardial infarction is not suggested no, by such changes no. uh, for an old myocardial infarction a q wave has to be present in okay. the qrs complex a deep q wave has to be present only then you will label it as an old myocardial infarction this just signifies ischemia and you must then evaluate these patients the best thing would be do if somebody has this would be to go out for a stress test the best stress test is a treadmill test or a TMT if a patient can do it or there are no contraindications to it. There are other kinds of stress tests like a dobutamine stress test. Sometimes you can do a thallium stress test. So you can find out the abnormality. And then during exercise if you are able to either pick up symptoms or you are able to pick up changes on the ECG during the exercise that adds more value to it. Once you are able to diagnose uh, coronary artery disease then what you can do is then you have to take the patient up for angiography find out exactly where the uh, obstruction is what kind of obstruction is it what is the degree of obstruction to the coronary arteries or coronary vessels and then you go ahead and further manage these patients but such a patient it is very important to at least on your own start disprin maybe start a beta blocker if there are indications if patient is having significant chest pain and you can also add sorbitrates or nitrates if a patient is having chest pain so these are a few things that you must take care of in uh, ECG of such patients is it required to repeat the ECG after some particular interval of time and see if you are having such a florid change in the ECG it's not required however if you are having very mild changes say there is only on one or two leads and you are not very specific about it you can repeat it after a period of interval of time and then see whether the changes are persisting or not many times you can have isolated STT changes which are not very significant for example in a post operative state uh, there can be ST depression also in patients who are hypertensive just have hypertension and have STT depression that is just part of the enlarged left ventricle so that is not such a big problem then there can be in young in, in women who are even cholecystitis cholelithiasis there can be STT changes so you should you should be very very cautious before you label any STT change as having a coronary artery disease but it is better to always evaluate these patients seeing the clinical condition seeing the situation for example, if there was a diabetic, say, and who had STT changes on this ECG, that STT change is extremely significant for a diabetic. Okay, so you have to evaluate that in the circumstance in which the but patient. You mentioned that hypertensives can also have this kind of yes. a change. Now, hypertensives do go in for ischemia also. Yes. How do we distinguish that it is pure hypertension or is it because of ischemia? No, you will also have hypertensive changes on the ECG. Okay. You will have um, increase in voltage of the um, QRS complex and on of course you will also have the patient having a high blood, blood pressure, pressure on mm -hmm. evaluation so and then an echo will demonstrate to you when you do an echo you should order an echo it will show you left ventricular hypertrophy concentric enlargement and then you can then probably say it is because of this but you are right hypertension is one of the major risk factors for development of coronary artery disease so 
if a patient is hypertensive and also has stt changes and you are not very sure whether it is cad or not in such a situation then the best thing would be to put the patient on a beta blocker it will take care of both hypertension as well as cad so that is why you need to evaluate these patients very carefully before you go further right now let us see the next set of ecgs these are ecgs which will which are also quite seen quite frequently and this require very urgent attention or intervention what you can see on these ecgs as has been rounded uh, seen in the circle is there is only one prominent negative deflection in v1 v2 v3 which is called the qs complex which means that there is a very deep q wave and a s wave so it's called a qs complex there is also some st elevation if you can see that the st segment is elevated so this is a picture of an acute myocardial infarction it is involving lead v1 v2 and v3 which means it's an anteroseptal myocardial infarction and since the q wave has come in it means that the myocardial infarction has evolved to some extent though not completely since st segment changes are still persisting in comparison to this if you see this ecg this is showing st elevation in leads 2 lead 3 and lead avf here you see the q wave has not appeared okay if you can see here the q wave is very small so there is not a significant q wave you only have prominent st elevation which is suggestive of an acute myocardial infarction in this setting of acute myocardial infarction you can also see that in the reciprocal leads that is lead 1 avl and v1 v2 you are having stt changes so this is just part of the ongoing ischemia and these are taken as reciprocal changes which are indicated by these red arrows another ecg where you can see that in the anterolat anterol septal leads lead v1 v2 v3 v4 you have prominent st elevation so this is a very prominent st elevation if you can see and here you see that the q waves have not come which means that patient is having an acute myocardial infarction myocardial infarction is always a medical emergency and you must treat these patients urgently and emergently if you are in a setup where you can manage these patients very good you need to use some kind of a reperfusion therapy or thrombolysis if you do it or if your center has a primary ptca facility you should consider that but you must admit all these patients provide pain relief and start appropriate management early and initially if somebody comes to you with chest pain of 4 hours and you in your clinic are sitting and you do this ecg you should never send the patient home on a tablet of nitrate you must at least the e earliest thing you can do is give a tablet of sorbitrate give a tablet of dispirin which you can do in your setting send the patient immediately to the hospital nearby hospital which is equipped to manage acute myocardial infarction why do we not say that this is um, uh, insufficiency uh, or uh, rather than mi no st elevation can occur in only two or three circumstances one of them is a myocardial infarction where you have this kind of an st elevation the other which we can have is acute pericarditis and but there it will be a more global it will be occurring in more than one leads and so generally if you have an st elevation like this you should always think in terms of uh, myocardial, myocardial infarction. infarction and send the patient up for further management uh let's go ahead and see some other abnormalities which can occur and the abnormalities which can occur in such situations are abnormalities of rhythm um you can have various types of heart blocks what is happening here if you see is that the pr interval which is this is the pr interval here the pr interval is progressively increasing there is one p wave and then there is no qrs the qrs is dropped similarly here the pr is progressively increasing and then it is getting dropped so it is a type 1 av block similarly you can have type 2 av blocks where there is a 2 is to 1 conduction meaning there is one p wave one qrs one p wave no qrs one p wave followed by qrs a p wave followed by no qrs so this is called a 2 is to 1 conduction meaning there are two p waves for each of the two p waves there is only one qrs so this is what is called a 2 is to 1 block these are all various types of heart rhythm abnormalities which can occur in settings of coronary artery disease ischemic heart disease uh, dilated cardiomyopathy uh, these are situations where you can have all such kinds of blocks you can also have we, we i told you that the 
duration of QRS is very important. So, if you see here the QRS duration is prolonged and this is typical a feature of bundle branch block. And here if you see in V1 the prominent wave is an R wave or a positive wave it is a right bundle branch block. In a left bundle branch block you will have again QRS duration prolonged but a prominent R pa pattern in the lateral lead. So, that will be a left bundle branch block. Another very common abnormality which most elderlies have at some point of time or the other is ventricular ectopics. So, you have an abnormal QRS where you can see that there is a very bizarre shaped QRS which is not preceded by a P wave and this is what is called an ectopic. Ectopics can occur commonly in elderly patients. It is nothing to worry about, nothing at all. If you find many times if you hold your grandparents hand or even your parents hand for that matter you will find that they themselves will say that I miss beats. It is a normal phenomenon which can occur and nothing needs to be done unless there is an underlying structural heart disease. If patient has an underlying structural heart disease VPCs have to be taken seriously otherwise normally also VPCs can occur in the normal population. So, I think uh, we have covered most of the uh, uh, heart rate abnormalities, rhythm abnormalities and uh, the beats abnormalities. So, I think uh, we hope that we will be having questions in the next session concerning the ECG during the break you can discuss and write down your questions and even facts during the break. So, thank you Dr. Anuradha thank for you, this Dr. session. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.